This is me talking about some principles of biomechanics and physics and more importantly trying to explain why this is important to you as physiotherapists. So I've tried to make it as straightforward as possible and try to give you some examples of why this is important to you in your career. It is important to have some definitions of these terms. I'm going to put this slide in now but I'm going to end the PowerPoint with this and I'm going to let it run for a few minutes so you've got access to it. So this is Isaac Newton who was a professor at Cambridge and he came up with three laws of motion which are important and we're going to talk about each one of them and I'm going to give you an example of how that relates to physiotherapy. By the way, I also lecture at Cambridge, just thought I'd throw that in. So it's close to dinner time, so we're using meat pies as an example. So Newton's first law says, if I put a pie on a table, it stays there forever unless something acts upon it to move it. If it starts to move, it keeps moving forever until something stops it. Why do we need to know this? Well, if a footballer kicks a football, they go into knee extension. The knee will keep extending forever until something stops it. So either the cruciate ligaments, the muscles at the back of the knee, the grass, the football, or the opponent. Newton's second law says that if I throw the pie towards you, it goes in the direction of the throw, and the harder I throw it, the further it goes. Why do we need to know this as physiotherapists? So I'm treating a private patient and I'm doing spinal manipulation on them and I'm pushing down on the lumbar vertebrae. If I push down on the lumbar vertebrae, the vertebra moves down. The harder I push, the further it goes down. Newton's third law is the law of action and reaction. So if I put the pie on my tummy, and it weighs 20 newtons, my tummy pushes back with a force of 20 newtons. Why do I need to know this as a physiotherapist? So I'm looking after a patient on intensive care who's ventilated, who can't move, who's overweight. They weigh 200 kilograms. They push down on the bed with a force of 200 kilograms. The bed pushes back with a force of 200 kilograms that means that they are a risk of pressure sores. Now we're going to move on to the concept of levers. There are three classes of lever. There's a first class lever, a second class lever and a third class lever. And it all depends on where the pivot or the fulcrum is. The way that I remember this is the word flee, F-L-E. So for a first class lever, the fulcrum's in the middle. For a second class lever, the load is in the middle. And for a third class lever, the effort is in the middle. Why do we need to know this? Well, the different joints have got different ways of moving. There are different types of levers. So here we've got the gastrocnemius, the muscles at the back of the skull, and the biceps. They are all examples of different classes of levers. Why do we need to know this as physiotherapists? Well, for this example of lifting a weight, I need to know that the fulcrum is my elbow joint. So the elbow joint is taking a lot of the rotatory strain. The effort's being produced by the biceps and the load is being produced by the weight. If I have a really long forearm, that's gonna be even harder to lift. If I have a really short forearm, or if I put the weight partway down my forearm, it's much easier because the leverage is different. Here's a graphic of a guy using leverage to his mechanical advantage. It's very easy for him to lift this boulder because he's got a long lever arm. If we ask a patient to lift the hip up into flexion, number one here is going to be much easier for the patient because the lever arm is much shorter. Number two is harder for the patient because the lever arm is longer. To make it even harder, we put a weight on the ankle. If you are trying to undo this nut, put your hand in position B, it's going to be much easier for you to undo the nut than in position A. Arnold's going to find it much easier to lift guinea pigs laterally rather than cats. 
Now we're going to talk about the concepts of momentum and inertia. I'm making this probably a bit too simple, but momentum is the tendency of a body to keep moving unless something stops it. And inertia is kind of the opposite. It's the tendency of something to stay put unless you push it. So here's a lorry and a car. Once the lorry gets going, it has a massive amount of momentum, but there's more inertia. It takes more force to get the lorry moving in the first place. But once you get it going, it goes like crazy. An elephant has got more inertia than a human using the same argument. Why do we need to know this as physiotherapists? Let's say that we're treating a person who's been in a road traffic collision and they have a seat belt on. We need to understand the concepts of momentum and inertia. So the person's driving along and they hit a car or a wall or something stationary. The body stays put because the seat belt restrains them, but the head keeps going. The brain keeps going inside the skull and it will whiz backwards and forwards. And it could cause some serious trauma to the neck, the ligaments, the nerves or the brain. It can actually give you what's called an internal decapitation where the spinal cord is actually severed. Another useful example of momentum and inertia is a similar thing and you see this in traumatic brain injuries. There's a thing called a diffuse axonal injury and you can see in this graphic that the shock of the trauma has actually ripped apart the nerves and kind of dislocated the synapses and that's related to inertia and momentum of the brain inside the skull. We're now going to talk about centre of gravity. I just thought that was a really cool photo. The centre of gravity is the point in your body about which all the weight appears to act. And it's quite interesting because it can move. So here's a guy standing in a normal person. The centre of gravity is just in front of your second sacral vertebra. If you lift your arms up, it goes up slightly. And if you bend forwards, your centre of gravity actually falls outside your body. So in a position like this where you are touching your toes or you're diving or doing some kind of high jump, it's actually possible for your centre of gravity to lie outside your body. Here's an example of the centre of gravity falling outside of the body. Why do physios need to know this? Well, every time we move, we move our centre of gravity. So we need to know what we're doing to somebody's centre of gravity so we can assess whether it's going to be easy for them, hard for them and so on. Now we're going to talk about the line of gravity. The line of gravity is just a vertical line that goes through the centre of gravity. In order for somebody to be stable, that line has to fall within your base of support. So the bigger your base, the more likely it is to fall within that line. Here's the line of gravity falling between your feet. Now we're going to talk about base of support. So this is all about stability, really. So if a car's on four wheels, it's not going to fall over because the center of gravity and the line of gravity fall within the four tires. If the car goes up onto two wheels, it can balance, but it's very difficult because the base of support is much smaller and the line, the orange line, is much more likely to wobble around and fall inside and then outside the base of support. Same thing for a patient who's standing on one leg. So why do physios need to know this? So if we look at these three people here, the person who's lying down is very stable. There's no way that they can fall over. The person in the middle is a little bit more stable than the person who's standing but the person who's standing is the least stable. It takes the most effort to keep that line of gravity within the base. Relevance to physio is if you've got a patient who's doing something that's very athletic and a lot of movements involved, it takes an awful lot of control to keep that person balanced. Here's somebody walking with two sticks and you can see how the base of support is massively increased. So they're gonna be much more stable. Don't forget that the base of support is not only your feet, it's anything that is in contact with the ground. So here's a picture of the base of support for one foot, two feet, 
and then a person with a walking stick and you can see how a walking stick or a crutch massively increases the base of support and makes them much more stable. It's much harder for that line of gravity to fall outside that blue shaded area. It's also important if you're looking at somebody's stability. So if somebody squats down, the center of gravity, which is marked CG here, is lower to the ground. So that makes them relatively more stable. We're now going to talk about the concept of friction. You've all come across friction. So here's a guy who's trying to light a fire. If he rubs the stick for long enough, it's going to get hot. It's going to cause friction and it's going to cause a fire. Why do we need to know this? Well, for everyday physiotherapy work and also for your exams. So let's say in one of your exams, you have to analyze these two movements. You've got somebody who's painting a wall and somebody who's scraping old wallpaper off a wall. The muscle work's gonna be different. For the guy that's letting the roller down, that's probably going to be eccentric work of the shoulder abductors to control the roller going down the wall. But for the diagram on the right, the guy's having to work really hard to push. So he's having to overcome friction. So he's probably using his shoulder extensors concentrically rather than his shoulder abductors. Here's an illustration of somebody who's a wheelchair user who needs to minimize the amount of friction. So they're using a sliding board to help them to transfer. That's a way of minimizing friction. You also find it in anatomy where there are areas of constant movement. So if you've got a tendon which is constantly moving backwards and forwards, that's going to generate friction and that's going to generate heat and inflammation, which isn't good. You're going to need to put some kind of slippery sheath around the tendon to minimize the friction. Same kind of thing in the shoulder. So this orange thing here is the subacromial bursa. There's a small tunnel in the shoulder called a subacromial arch. And a lot of things move through that and they can get compressed and irritated. And the bursa is there to try and minimize the friction. Probably one of the best examples in physiotherapy of use of friction is the ferrule at the bottom of a crutch. It's a ferrule. The thing on the left is a ferrule. The thing on the right is a ferret. Please don't get that wrong. I've had that before and it really didn't end well. <laughs>